the Bitcoin Group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. This week, we'd like to welcome the panelists. We've got Chris J from Feathercoin. Hello. Megan Lords from Bitcoin, not bombs. Greetings, Bitcoiners. Derek J. Freeman from Peace News Now. What a week in Bitcoin. And Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Good morning, Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Screen share is instantly broken, so so much for all my graphical work this week. Issue 1, Bitcoin New York Hearings. The Wired Magazine headline that you can't see, Bitcoin's fate is in the hands of clueless regulators, says it all. New York Development of Financial Services held two days worth of hearings despite never bothering to try Bitcoin for themselves. They don't understand Bitcoin at all, and yet they're in a rush to regulate. Do we need the state of, the New, York, state of New York to regulate Bitcoin? Is Bitcoin regulation good for the state of New York or the United States? I ask you, Chris J. I think right now you either treat Bitcoin as a learning opportunity or you treat it as a threat. And I, it, I fully expect them to do the most logical thing. The biggest downfall that regulators and governments have is that they behave in pre uh, predictable ways. The one thing we have on our side is that we have a goal. We actually have something that we're working towards. All they want to do is maintain the status quo. So yeah, I think that this is just a lot of posturing and I don't see it as a particular threat. Um, America is just one country among many. Megan Lords. It was painful watching that. They don't know the first thing about Bitcoin and uh, they're trying to control it anyway. Um, so I, I think it's kind of amusing to watch. It, it, like, it, it's kind of funny because there is this kind of air of condescension towards Bitcoiners, especially the anti-regulator uh, you know, side of things. Um, you know, very condescending, kind of like, oh, well, we don't need you, you know, once we get our regulation on. But uh, I, I think it'll be really interesting how it plays out and how much uh, it'll kind of come out that we don't need them as much as they're probably going to need us in regards to explaining it to them so they'll understand what exactly it is they're trying to regulate. So uh, no, uh, we don't need the state of New York to regulate Bitcoin. I, I don't think it's uh, good for anyone um, and I think they're going to have a hard time doing it anyway. Derek J, no relation. <laughs> well <laughs> regulation is about monitoring and enforcement of rules. And rules can be enforced by markets. So when people don't like a particular company or exchange, they'll switch to alternatives that they prefer. So no, we do not need the state of New York to regulate Bitcoin because when government regulates, there's an implied threat of force, meaning fines or jail time. And this force is not necessary and can actually be harmful, not only to individuals, but to the entire industry. Will Pengman. Yeah, um... Regulators are very busy trying to get their grubby mitts all over this technology, but like you said in your opening, they don't understand it at all. Um, it's, it's something that has inherent qualities about it that it appears they ignored completely and you know decided to apply their whims for certain inherent qualities they'd like it to have or they're going to force upon it. Uh, Bitcoin's core belies those, you know, central inherent co inherent qualities they'd like to impose on it, um, and and this went over their heads despite the best efforts of all of the um, the witnesses or panelists at the hearings who were basically cheerleading for regulation and trying their best to help uh, the regulators understand the technology. Uh, while still explaining the underlying feature set of Bitcoin that belies their traditional methods for, for regulation. So, um, yeah, they, it's, it seems like, uh, it seems like they, they, um, they just won't, they just won't uh, achieve their goals and they'll spin their wheels. And, and meanwhile, the light speed pace of innovation in Bitcoin and decentralized technologies and cryptocurrencies in general will just continue to accelerate far past them. 
Absolutely. I agree with Will. The inherent qualities of Bitcoin, the ability for one person to send part of a Bitcoin from one address to the other address, are unregulatable. It's math, it's cryptography, it's, cryptography, it's a network. What you say in New York has nothing that can affect that transaction. This is a wholly new market that you've never seen before. And you didn't even do your basic homework. You didn't even learn how to send Bitcoin. You didn't even sign up, buy $10 worth, buy a book on Amazon, send some to a charity. The briefest and most minimal amount of research necessary to understand Bitcoin is to try it out. Try it out for yourself. It's not theoretical. It's like email. You can log in, get an account, send some around. It's kind of magical. It's, you can't take it back. Once the email is sent, it's gone. Once your Bitcoin is sent, it's gone. You should try it out, regulators of New York, who are obviously in a big hurry to regulate this. I don't know who asked them to regulate this. The other word of the hearing was clearly hubris. As Andreas said, and we all agreed in our chat earlier this week, hubris. That like the gods, the, the regulators of New York, the financial former financial capital of the world, are now here to regulate us. And they don't seem to care what we think at all. Exit question. Which state will attempt to regulate Bitcoin next? And will they do it better? Of course, we're asking Chris J from London, England. Pretty much I'm name a state. <laughs> I, I'm holding out for Hawaii. <laughs> Um, I really, I really love the look of it in the brochures, and I'd love to live there. So I'm really hoping that they're going to be, you know, dropping a ton of libertarianism on that state, and then I can go live there with all my bitcoins. Uh, Otherwise, I don't know enough about it. <laughs> a great decision. Choose your state based upon travel plans. Megan Lords. Uh, well, I think the next state to regulate it or to attempt to regulate it may be New Jersey. I think they're really desperate for any kind of revenue right now, and. Um, there was also a recent report that came out that uh, I, belie I believe it is New Jersey that has the highest amount of people on government assistance already. And I'm, you know, if they're smart, I'm sure they'll view Bitcoin as a way to uh, kind of get their hands on that. Derek, Jay. You're all wrong. California will be next. It's uh, the fact that Silicon Valley is in California rather than New York, if that's any indication, California will not regulate as harshly and will be all the better for it. Will Pangman. I, I tend to think Derek's probably right, um, but uh, I'm just going to throw a wild card in there. Um, Florida, you know, the conference was just in Miami, and it was very well received by all of the, you know, the business culture in general, the entrepreneurs down there, and Miami is closer to, I think, a dozen um, national capitals. It's closer to 12 foreign national capitals than it is to Washington, D.C., which just makes it a prime spot for you know, the international potential that Bitcoin can provide. Excellent answers all. I, I appreciately enjoyed uh, Megan's answer of New Jersey because it gives me the chance to mention that Christie's right-hand man, Wildstein, at the Port Authority has turned over on him today, saying that Governor Christie knew about the bridge closing. <laughs> of course but, he knew about the bridge closing. <laughs> so I think New Jersey's going to be shopping for a new governor. They might be a little busy and unable to regulate Bitcoin. I'm going to have to side with Derek on this one. California will be the next. They'll regulate lightly. They'll have a wait-and-see approach. They'll use logic. They'll, maybe they'll even try Bitcoin out before they regulate it. I would be blown away if they did that. Even just the smallest bit of trial would, before regulating, before talking about it publicly, just the smallest bit of trial would be really amazing. And what California has the potential to do is to do the opposite of what mm. New York did and to provide a safe haven for Bitcoiners, to provide safety for their companies and their employees, which is obviously not going to happen in the state of New York. Issue two. And everyone at home needs to imagine that there's graphics over the screen. Bitcoin, civil war. In a highly regarded article written earlier this week, Business Insider declared a civil war between pro-regulation Bitcoiners and pro-freedom Bitcoiners and had the gall to claim that the pro-regulation Bitcoiners were winning. Isn't Business Insider missing the obvious point that Bitcoin the protocol, like BitTorrent before it, is a network? and doesn't care about your regulations? Megan Lords. 
<laughs> uh, I saw some of this at the Miami conference, actually. There was a lot of tension between the pro-regulatory side and the anti-regulatory side. And there was a lot of representation, though, uh, on the pro-regulatory side. Um, Carol Van Cleef, the, one of the women at the uh, New York Financial Services hearings, uh, the one who was pushing for that, like, uh, really, like, dinosaur-like currency, like, oh, we kind of need this currency backed by gold that's kind of like Bitcoin, but we can kind of regulate it. She actually told my friend Michelle, uh, very stoically, very, like, eerily, uh, a lot of you are going to jail. Like, a lot of you people in this room are going to jail. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a reality that I, I think uh, we may have to be facing. Um, but, yes, there there is some tension there. And, uh, I don't know, as far as who will win, or, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know. I I don't really think uh, it can be regulated. I mean, they're they're gonna try. I don't I don't know if uh, the pro regulatory side is winning uh, necessarily. I don't know. If that's the word for it. But they're trying really hard and uh, very much have this air of superiority and uh, very very pompous. But I uh, I don't think they know what they're up against. Derek J. Andreas Antonopoulos said it best in his tweet earlier this week, which was retweeted by Mad Bitcoins, quote, Bitcoin will not be what you want it to be or what you regulate it to be. Bitcoin is governed by consensus, and you're not part of that. Bye. Will Pangman. Um, I think it's interesting. I wish there wouldn't be a, a so-called civil war. I can understand why the two sides would conflict, you know, the... Uh, the capital investment camp and the early adopting libertarian crypto anarchy camp. Uh, they should really work together in my opinion. I, here's a strategy that I think uh, was kind of underlying the hearings um, as I was ruminating on it after they were over. Uh, these well-funded um, large Bitcoin businesses that m many of which had representatives at, at the hearings are asking for regulation and telling the regulators please pay attention to us, please watch us like a hawk, we want to play by your rules and spend tons of money doing so. Um, I think they want that because they see, you know, even though there's a huge cost there, that once they get the seal of approval, so to speak, there's a 10x, 100x, maybe more um, addition to their bottom line in doing so. So they see the ability to make much more money by getting that seal of approval from, you know, the iron fist, if you will. Meanwhile, I think the, the state, if you will, the bureaucracies, will be far too focused and paying way too close attention on um, the very superficial aspects of regulatory compliance of these big, well-funded businesses. Um, while, on the other hand, the crypto anarchists out there aren't going to stop what they've started since 1992, and it's only gaining so much steam. I mean, it's going so fast. I know all of us who live in it live in Bitcoin can feel the pace, the, the breakneck pace of this uh, innovation. And things like Ethereum, Colored Coins, MasterCoin, and so on, uh, decentralizing everything, making any attempt to, um, you know, squelch creativity and free, you know, freedom of interaction, essentially, freedom of association, freedom of speech, and so on, making it impossible to, to stop the way that the state and bureaucracies are used to doing so over the last, you know, 100 years, 200 years, 2,000 years. So I think they could kind of work together, um, you know, if there's more decentralization and more innovation in Bitcoin, these, these well-funded businesses who obviously understand the technology, whereas the regulators don't, uh, they certainly see the potential to make more money through the newer innovations coming out, as well as through the seal of approval method from, from the state. So it's a win-win for both sides if they can kind of like, you know, um, play the foil for each other, so to speak. Chris, Jay. Was the article that highly regarded? I thought it was link bait. I thought, I thought that that publication basically just wrote headlines to get people to click on the link so that they could view the ads, so they could turn to their advertisers and say, look, we are getting the metrics we told you we were. Um, no, it was just they were deliberately trying to create division and they were just trying to get people to click on that article. I didn't learn anything from it. I think it's a false dichotomy anyway. I think that right now the axis is tyranny versus freedom. And the only thing worse than a dictator is a slave in a system who wishes he was the dictator. That's what I can't stand. So when I do hear fellow Bitcoiners talk about 
you know, wanting regulation. What I'm hearing is you want to make money and you don't want to wait. You don't want to have to do the hard work necessary. What you want to do is waste your time jumping through hoops. These people have rules that enforce past actions. They don't actually bake the regulation into the code. And so all you're ever going to do is be playing catch up. That's why I think that we've got the edge here because the faster we change, if we increase our rate of change, they're never going to be able to catch up. Um, because you're just going to get this red queen effect where they're just running in order to stand still. So I think that the, the people, that the, the entrepreneurs that, that want regulation, I, I kind of sympathize a little bit because they just want to go out and make money, but there's a wider, and permission to be a bit um, philosophical, um, I would say that the, there are two types of rules um, in the world. Okay, There's the rules we can break, which we call human rules, and then there's the rules we can't, called physical rules. And the point of justice is that it sets us free because it gives us a set of rules that helps us navigate the ones we have no control over. So choosing the right rules at the outset, like something like a fixed issuance currency does, where everything's baked into the design, um, is, a, is a very good system in my opinion. I don't think it's a very good system when people start writing rules that make it very convenient for them to, um, I mean, maybe I could put this a bit differently. Um, one thing you can always rely on governments to do is disagree with each other to maintain the status quo within their borders, right? That's what the UN is about. That's what all those uh, meetings we watch in the news, all they ever do is disagree. But what Bitcoin enables us to do is reach a global consensus in an unfalsifiable way because it's based on the universal language of mass. That's got to be a much better starting point. We can actually circumvent governments altogether by reaching a consensus without their permission, by full stop. And that, and that I think, is the work that needs to be done. I agree. It does stretch a lot further than what they're looking at. The ability to build a distributed voting system with Bitcoin, the ability to send uh, deeds, contracts, wills, and trusts right. are far beyond what they're thinking about and what they're really trying to regulate. Like, That's probably what they're afraid of. That's what you just said there. That's what they're afraid of. It's, the, it's our ability to cooperate with one another, with our own voting systems. That's what scares them, I think. Absolutely. Derek J? In uh, the the question uh, yeah. being who which side will win the Bitcoin civil war? Yes, which side will win? Well, unlike the movies, uh, the good guys don't always win. And if uh, pro freedom Bitcoiners can get Bitcoin into the hands of the masses and get them using it without the regulation, they'll resist future intrusions by government. And the the fact that Ethereum has already been released shows that pro freedom Bitcoiners already have a clear lead in this war. And th it's worth noting that while we may call it a war or a battle, only one side is fighting with guns and cages. Shame on them. Mm -hmm. Will Pangman. Who will win? Um, definitely the pro-freedom Bitcoiners, uh, the pro-freedom um, tech innovators. The, it's, you know, the speed is just far too fast. I mean, the regulators are still working in a paper world. And, you know, Derek mentioned it earlier, Ethereum and these next-gen technologies are going to eliminate any possibility for external, um, external laws to be applied on. I really liked what Chris said, um, making the distinction between natural law and man-made man law. Uh, you know, man can't thwart the law of gravity, and, and you know, if you bake uh, regulation or, or rules into the code of a particular innovation, and that's all that's needed, and, and that can be arrived at uh, by consensus, and network effect will, will show the winner. And I think what we're seeing here is, um, you know, the future of money or of interaction, economic interaction, is in cryptocurrency. Uh, and so we're all ahead of the game right now, and eventually it will be like Teflon. So, and, and I completely agree with Derek. Shame on, shame on those who would fight this... Um, fight this altercation with violence. Chris, Jay. Um, I think that ultimately when, when a king starts stealing from his people, the people are incentivized for change. And I think the mistake that a lot of these governments made was they got greedy. They didn't cut us in on the deal. They didn't give us anything back and just kept taking and taking. So I think that, well, my, my knee-jerk reaction actually would be to say it's up to us, that the future's don't invent themselves. Um, but yeah, I, I think the freedom is going to win. Megan Lords. Bitcoin will win. Whoever is on the side of innovation, um, and not just Bitcoin, 
cryptocurrencies in general. It, it, I'm very excited about the Ethereum project. Whoever's on the side of innovation is going to win this. Uh, whoever's thinking ahead, and I'm not talking about like you know a year ahead, five years ahead. I'm talking 50 years ahead to the future. Megan's more absolutely than that. Right. And she stole my answer. Bitcoin will win. <laughs> the protocol will win. The network uh -huh. will win. TCPIP will win. Whatever can deliver money fast uh, under a consensus in a trusted network is going to win. And that seems to be our system. Their system is cash. Their system is control. It's banks. And while I don't exactly see Will's rosy vision of the uh, anar crypto anarchists, the libertarians, and the capitalists all getting down for a tea party, I do think that the war analogy is a bit overblown, but I enjoy the media hype of a good war analogy. So, And I was quoted in the article, so I had to go with it. <laughs> Moving on, issue three. And again, you're visualizing graphics here. Bit instant CEO arrested. Charlie Shrum, partner of the Winklevi, a $6 million man, was arrested at the JFK airport upon his return from the Miami Bitcoin conference. Not at his office, not at his home, but at the airport. What is the government trying to say with this arrest? Will the charges hold water? Derek J. Now, caging Charlie, who's not even been accused of hurting anyone or creating a victim, is simply an intimidation tactic. His charges were one count operating an unlicensed money transmitting business, one count of money laundering conspiracy, one count willful failure failure to file suspicious activity report. Essentially, he's being charged with not being paranoid enough about reporting his customers to the aid to the uh, authorities. He hasn't done anything wrong, and the authorities who are charging him with so-called crimes even admit in their charges that he hasn't created any victims. Will Pangman. Yeah, I was, um, you know, not happy to hear that one of the, you know, pioneers of, of the Bitcoin, you know, making Bitcoin accessible to the masses um, was uh, taken, off, taken off our hands here temporarily. I don't think the charges will stick. That's just my initial gut reaction. You know, um, these thought crimey charges. Uh, I got to think Charlie, it, you know, has, has several lawyers on retainer who've been preparing for such an, you know, you know, such a thing to come up as him being arrested or linked to the Silk Road or whatever. Um, it's it's all spurious allegations, it sounds like, if you read the indictment. And, um, yeah, I mean, you, it, if you were a user of BitInstant and you realized how creative he and his company had to be to make Bitcoin accessible to people I as instantly as possible, going through, like, three or four different proxies um, to you know, to make it uh, available to anyone who could get close to a MoneyGram red phone or, or whatever. Uh, you know, I often like buying, um, buying Bitcoins through BitInstant, going to the red phone, you know, the bat phone, I would always call it. And, uh, you know, I have some fond memories of that from the springtime. I think, um, you know, Charlie will be back. It's, it's too bad that this might spoil some of his associations, that, you know, he had some good things in the works and not seeing him on the, um, on the Bitcoin Foundation board anymore is again a little bit disappointing um, but I think ultimately what we'll see is you know, hopefully he'll be uh, exonerated of all or most of these charges and the you know the veil of uh, authoritarianism um, will will fall and or, you know we'll pull back the curtain on the wizard here for for all to see and 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 more people who've been looking at this from the sidelines thinking I really like the idea of Bitcoin but I'm too scared to get involved because I think the government's going to shut it down or whatever um, when they see kind of the more of this behavior from the state and we had this discussion in the last topic too uh, the these actions are just making these hypocrites um, out themselves as hypocrites and more and more people will see this and uh, I, I think this is, you know, un unfortunately, these are steps that have to happen, and there's pain that we have to go through along this process. But um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. The rosy view that I, I often espouse, um, I think, will be the one that we all end up, uh, you know, seeing that the, the credibility of the state regulators and governments in general is falling 
dramatically day by day, and, and cryptocurrencies are accelerating this process. So, Chris, Jay. Yeah, I think all governments really do is posture, don't they? I just felt like, I just feel like they don't know what to do. So they just do what they, they know how. They just do what their rule book tells them to do. I don't know too much about the details um, because I wasn't there. I didn't see what crime he committed. So I, I can't really comment on whether you know he's done anything wrong. Um, I sort of agree with Derek, though, that it doesn't appear as though he's created any victims. So quite why he needs to be put in a cage, I'm not sure, unless they feel he's a flight risk or something. Um, so yeah, I don't have much to add to, to what the other guy said. Pretty much agree. Megan Lords. We have to assume that we're being targeted for, uh, you know, being involved in Bitcoin. And I think the more high profile you are and the uh, bigger your organization are, the more uh, that you're probably being spied on. I mean, it, it's not, you know, any secret that the NSA is spying on everyone. Uh, they're probably especially scrutinizing Bitcoiners. Um, it's really unfortunate, though, because this is someone who hurt nobody, who does what the government does all the time. Hmm. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's I, I think it's showing uh, the government's own hypocrisy. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I think... I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if the charges will hold water. I really hope they set him free. Obviously, no one's been harmed, but the government needs a boogeyman. This week, it's, it's drug trafficking, and they're probably going to go with the drug trafficking thing for a while until they find something else that they can uh, negatively associate Bitcoin with. Uh, maybe it'll be something else, but uh, we have to be prepared for these things. Uh, you know, there it's very easy to demonize Bitcoin, and uh, but it is up to us to kind of be a counterforce against that demonization and show all of the awesome things that Bitcoin is being used for. I, one of the most popular things Bitcoin is used for is charity and helping people directly. And uh, that's, that's what I especially like to focus on. And I think if we get a lot more of this kind of positive message out um, to your average person, it's really going to be a foil to the hypocrisy of government throwing someone in a cage for completely nonviolent activity. So uh, it, it's up to us to, uh, you know, kind of put forth, I guess, positive propaganda, if you will, and uh, be careful about our actions with Bitcoin, too. Uh, we have to assume we're being watched. We have to assume even there, maybe there's even been, you know, some infiltration or something. So uh, be, being cautious, but also, uh, you know, showing the world what Bitcoin can actually do. I agree, Megan. There's a lot of great examples of Bitcoin charity, such as, Jason King from Sean's Outpost, who's running across America at BitcoinAcrossAmerica.com. He's got an RV and he's also running, so to raise uh, awareness for homelessness and charity. So you can check that out at BitcoinAcrossAmerica.com. But if you really look at the Charlie Shrem arrest and what he's accused of doing, they're accused of selling bitcoins to the users of the Silk Road via the forums of the Silk Road. Now, it does look like some of the users were able to get Bitcoins without entering any of their personal information, and that may be some kind of a small regulatory issue. But as far as the core issue of giving someone money and then being held responsible for what they did with that money, I really don't see that how they can hold Shrem responsible for that, because if that's true, every ATM in America that gives someone money that presumably could be used on a drug deal is guilty. Every bank is guilty. Every person that you give money to, you don't know what they do with it. They could go skydiving. They could drink a fifth of whiskey. There's a lot of horrible things that people can do to themselves, and giving them money should not be a crime. It's money. So moving on. Exit question. Much ado about nothing. Spot judgment. Forced prediction. What is the outcome of Shrem's trial? Derek J. Well, it's, it's not much ado about nothing. It's very serious, but it's not what it appears on face. The Magna Carta 800 years ago gave us the principle of habeas corpus or show me the body. It is, we've all mentioned Shrem's actions hurt no one, so there is no victim or body to present. And conspiracy, furthermore, is a near impossible charge to prove. Uh, so the point is really not to convict him. The point is to intimidate others who want to innovate in the world of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. If the government were to apply their charges consistently, you're right, Thomas, they should be charging the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board because people use their dollars to buy drugs in black markets. 
And furthermore, the government is still operating on the old world principle that you can cut off the head of an organization to kill the whole thing. Bitcoin is bigger than any one person or group of people. It won't go away even if all the regulators put us all in cages. Will Pangman. Yeah, Derek's exactly right. It's, it's funny to watch this de these decapitation attempts. Um, maybe it's working for the Silk Road, you know, because that was, uh, you know, a centralized marketplace itself. Um, maybe it's working for people who were unscrupulously operating a Bitcoin business in, in New York City and, and things like that and have some, uh, you know, bad associations or whatever. But... Uh, this is what was done to Bernard von Nordhaus of the Liberty Dollar and gold money, e-gold. I mean, when, when there are these competitors um, that are acting lawfully, hurting nobody, but cutting into, um, you know, a, a closed system that's monopolized, they cut, it off, they cut off the head and everyone goes back to business as usual and everyone um, who might have been interested in doing business with that enterprise is scared off from doing so, not just in the moment, but for years on. So we have no head to cut off with cryptocurrencies. And it's, it's hilarious. The hypocrisy is, is, is really hilarious to watch. The outcome of Shrem's trial, I don't think there will be a trial. Um, we will, it won't even get that far. Uh, there's, a, there's a great clip of the upcoming The Rise and Rise of Bitcoin documentary where Charlie Shrem is quoted as saying that he spends thousands of dollars a day on lawyers to keep him out of jail. And uh, I'm taking him at his word for that. And I think, you know, we've all discussed, if you've read the indictment, you can tell how spurious and, um, you know, he's like tertiarily charged with conspiracy. It's, you know, it's not going to stick. Chris, Jay. Yeah, I've actually had some more thoughts since um, what's already been said. Uh, Bitcoin is a complex adaptive system. It's anti-fragile in its nature. So when we say it has no head, that, that, qu that, that statement doesn't even make any sense. Um, it doesn't need one because every single node in the network is a head. Every single node in the network is a master node and every single piece of software that's out there has the seeds for its own regeneration. So you're not going to be able to take it down. I think that the government are scared. I think that they don't know quite what to do. And I think they've seen this kind of thing before. And so, like I said before, I think, yes, I think it's much to do about nothing. I think that they're doing what they know how to do. I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. <laughs> Megan Lords. Um, I think uh, that he's got a great team of lawyers on his side. I think that's going to be very beneficial for him. If any of the charges stick, it'll be the failure to report the suspicious activity report. They take that shit really seriously, and uh, it's and it's total. I mean. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous, the whole idea of the suspicious activity report. But if any of the charges stick, I think it would be that one. Issue 4. BTC China accepts deposits, and perhaps they never should have stopped. BTC China now believes that the December 5th advice issued by the People's Bank of China only applies to banks and not to exchanges. BTC China has reopened for business. It's as if the last few months didn't mean anything. Is the 2-1 fear over? Bitcoin to the moon? I ask you, Will Pangman. Um, you know, I think they found a loophole, and on really close inspection of the guidances or announcements to come out of the, um, you know, the Chinese central bank and stuff like that, um, they, they found a loophole, and, and they, we always will. As long as we need to interface this new... Um, form of transaction, a value system with the legacy system, we're going to have to find these loopholes all along the way because, you know, these dinosaurs, they're lazy. They don't want to innovate. Uh, we're using the same system that existed. You could argue 5,000 years this system has existed, but let's just say 100 years, you know. Uh, the birthday of the Federal Reserve was a, just a few weeks over 100 years ago. But, um, yeah, the, it's like, you know, the, this iron fist is squeezing a fistful of sand and the sand is sifting through the knuckles and that will continue to happen. And, uh, you know, there's, there's incredibly creative geniuses that I'm always in awe of the, the ideas that they talk about in forums before they get to work and then they get to work and days or weeks later, very short periods of time, they've created new things. Um, 
that this can't be stopped. So, yep, it's um, it's exciting. I, I I just can't wait to see what 2014 has in store for the exchange in China, other exchanges in that country, um, Bitcoin businesses in that country, and other oppressive regimes around the world, um, and and also what what we might see in the U.S. too. Chris J, who appears to be muted. There you go. Uh, I have lost count of the number of times that China kept banning and unbanning Bitcoin, didn't you? And I don't think the market, if you look at the price, it's more stable than it's been for a very long time. Um, I think this is probably the longest period of stability that we've ever seen. So I think that the market is not stupid. I think that information was priced in to the function quite a long time ago. And I would say that one of the best attributes of an entrepreneur is to break the right rules in the right order in order to get yourself out of some kind of bind like if you look at all the great innovators in history like da Vinci or I don't know of course my mind goes blank right now but you know what I mean what they do is they acknowledge the reality of their situation in order to get somewhere more exciting so they learn how to work within their framework and I think that um, uh, Charlie Lee is, is uh, sorry Bobby Lee has done that beautifully and I also quite like the other one, is it called Hubie, who uh, the, the actual CEO started taking deposits personally in his personal bank accounts. So that kind of thing is very good. I think we need to move on from China anyway. I think um, I'd like to see India, uh, Africa, and South America come on board next. Megan, Lords. Yeah, I think the guys pretty much said what I was going to say uh, about Bitcoin in China. Um, yeah, I, I pretty much agree. Uh, I, I think uh, it was a little bump in the road there for a while, but yeah, it can't be stopped, and this is just indicative of the long run. So, uh, Bitcoin to the moon? I mean, I, I hope so, but I, I'm really enjoying the stability, and I kind of hope it stays uh, stable for a little bit longer, too, because it's a lot easier. Uh, what I've been doing is talking to business owners in Pensacola, trying to get people started. It's a lot easier to say, hey, look, this has been stable for a while. You know, they're going to be more comfortable accepting it uh, for their business if it's stable. So uh, yeah, I hope it kind of stays where it's at for a while. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry China, can't be stopped. It's a honey batter of money. Derek J. Yeah, BTC China accepting deposits again shows us that the world is changing in a really exciting way. I always hoped, but I never imagined in my lifetime it would be possible to disobey governments with near impunity. The Chinese government can pound sand when it comes to Bitcoin regulation. It doesn't matter what they say. The people using Bitcoin won't research the rules before researching how to use Bitcoin. And once they know, the rules don't matter. Bitcoin to the moon. Excellent. Ex exit question. Price check. What is the Bitcoin price one month from now? March 1st, 2014. Will Pengman. Um, I think we start to see a, a little creeping increase, um, but not uh, not any of these uh, crazy volatile, you know, major spikes. So maybe maybe we're back over a thousand by then, or getting close to it um, in terms of the average price across the exchanges. Chris J. Uh, I don't know what the price is going to do, and neither does anyone else. Um, I'm terrible at making predictions, but I, I don't think it will be lower than where it is today. Megan Lords. 873.5. Derek J. We've seen a lot of stability uh, these past months. I imagine that will continue, and I predict a price of $850. Well, I'm going to continue to lead the pack, and I'm going 1200 Issue 5. Visa CEO doesn't see Bitcoin as a business threat. Hubris seems to be the theme of this show. First, the NYDFS, then the pro-regulation crowd, and now Visa. If you can't say something nice, isn't it better to say nothing at all? Or have they opened Pandora's box? Chris J. Um, remember that these companies have quarterly earnings reports. They have shareholders. Uh, they've got to be seen to be doing something. Otherwise, it will be uh, looked upon as a sign of weakness. They were increasingly reticent and I think they were being made to look irrelevant. So, yeah, I wasn't surprised at what he said. I mean, what else did you expect him to say? Megan Lords. 
he's right in the short term. People are going to be using credit cards for a very long time. I think in the long term, uh, Bitcoin's definitely going to take over. It's just way easier to use. I mean, I, I it's inconvenient for me, like typing in my credit card, like whenever I have to buy something, if I'm not buying it with Bitcoin, uh, it, it's like I, I get like kind of. <laughs> kind of irritated by that. I don't know, like getting spoiled by Bitcoin. Um, but I mean, think of how long people took to adapt to the internet. I mean, I, I know people who still refuse to use it, who are still very terrified by it. So you're always going to have that, uh, I think, small percentage of people who are maybe, you know, hesitant to use it. And I think credit cards are going to be dominating for uh, the short term. But in the long term, I think Visa is going to uh, regret it. So... Derek J. Yeah, Sun Tzu wrote in The Art of War, quote, If your enemy thinks you're strong, appear weak. If your enemy thinks you're weak, appear strong. Visa is appearing strong, and that should tell us all we need to know. Will Pangman. Well put, Derek. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Megan. You know, we still have a long way to go before um, some of these com companies are made to be obsolete if they don't adapt. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who put up with the irritation that Megan described that even that she has and uh, that's the vast majority of people who are irritated with entering their credit card information or subjecting themselves to uh, identity theft risks and things like that but they still put up with it and even though it might be you know the the height of irritation um, meeting their you know the threshold for them they're still gonna go lockstep for a long time and that's just because I think um, you know mankind has been beaten into shape by governments for so long that um, it's going to take a long time before uh, you know the general public um, loses enough faith in these older legacy businesses. You know we've heard Jamie Dimon and his opinion on Bitcoin. Western Union uh, in the last quarter of last year issued their you know, little um, findings on their, you know, not seeing Bitcoin as a threat. If anyone should be worried, it should be Western Union. But, um, yeah, Visa doesn't surprise me. Um, and, and I don't think Bitcoin should, should be seen as a threat by any of these businesses. They should totally adapt and fold it into their model and slowly, you know, um, slowly grow. I really like the approach that we've seen from some freedom-minded um, CEOs out there, I'm thinking of Patrick Byrne and I'm thinking of Fred Wilson, who are mm -hmm. out there leading the charge and not afraid to kind of take take the, the plunge, so to speak. It's not that big of a plunge. I think I said this last week. I mean, you know, for a company as big as Overstock, it took them a few days, a couple coders and some business strategists, and they figured it all out. And now they accept Bitcoin six months ahead of schedule. Um, you know, Fred Wilson, forward thinking, same thing. You know, he, he wanted to invest in Bitcoin businesses as soon as he could, and he did. Uh, so hopefully we see some more, uh, you know, more forward-thinking um, entrepreneurs who have had lots of success in the past uh, do more. I'd like to see Richard Branson do more than just Virgin Galactic um, integrate Bitcoin into his other Virgin properties. I agree with uh, what Megan said. There was a great comic strip that came out this week. I meant to cover it on the show, but I haven't gotten to it yet. And it was from... Um, I, I can barely draw, or I can barely draw, something like that. And one of the points of the strip was how different the credit card industry is from Bitcoin. They said, well, in Bitcoin, the person who has the money sends the money, right? Then they said, in the credit card industry, they have your secret code, and once you give it to them, they initiate the transaction without your permission or knowledge, and that's why you can have wrong amounts charged or multiple amounts charged, double charges, because the system is completely backwards. Bitcoin restores the system to the way it's supposed to be. You keep your money. If you want to buy something from someone, you send them the money. They receive the money, and that's that. You don't need anything else. So I really think these businesses are in for a surprise. And as for Chris Jay's point, they did have a choice. They could have said nothing. If you're Like Derek was saying, if your opponent is superior to you, you should evade him. And they had the evasion option, but now they've identified their opponent, which... I mean, I know maybe Gandhi show, stole this from Schopenhauer, but first they ignore you, then they fight you, then you win, whatever. They've stopped ignoring us. That's a yes. mistake. I mean, they've entered a whole new phase. Does that mean they're laughing now? Or? They're laughing. <laughs> they're laughing. I, I think they're done I hope laughing. this bit doesn't last too the long. laughing is over, so I, there's no more laughing. 
but uh, we'll see what happens next. Um, exit question. Western Union, Visa, and PayPal have all mentioned Bitcoin. Which one will fall first? Chris J. Western Union, and I hope that PayPal will... I, well, I'm optimistic. I think those guys are going to innovate and adopt Bitcoin. Megan Lords. Oh, I hope Western Union, like, just crashes. I'd, I'd love to see them go down. Derek J. Yeah, I rely on Western Union sometimes, so I don't, I don't want to see them crash, but they will be the first to fall because they rely too heavily on brick-and-mortar institutions. That carries too much overhead. The other companies can integrate Bitcoin, but they can't. If they do that, people will just switch to using Bitcoin because it's easy enough. Will Pangman. Um, any country's central bank. Any country's central bank should bite the dust first before some of these private businesses do. That would be that would be a huge um, promotion right there for for Bitcoin adoption. Uh, and I'd like to just amend the the Gandhi Schopenhauer quote. I think what we're going to see is first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then we laugh at them, then they fight us, but we're not there anymore <laughs> because we've won. <laughs> Absolutely, it's it's impossible to fight someone that won't show up on the battlefield. The uh, the British had that problem during the Revolutionary War, uh, but yeah, I agree. It'll be Western Union that goes down first. They've been overcharging in fees for far too long. Andreas's favorite example is always that they charge you more to send money to a poorer country, and yes. that kind of vampire capitalism is the thing we need to get rid of first. And that's exactly what Bitcoin is against. Bitcoin would never charge you more dependent on your geographic location. It's address to address. It doesn't discriminate that way. And I think Western Union will be punished for their discrimination. Now, moving on to questions and answers. The part of the show where you ask questions and we get answers. Let's see. Uh, the protocol can now process, on average, 500 transactions every 10 minutes, less than one transaction a second. To match Visa in the USA, the protocol would have to be able to transact to process 2,000 transactions a second. Thus, the average block would be 600 megabytes. What would be the impact slash solution? Well, first of all, I'm not sure there's a problem. I mean, I think we can handle 600 megabyte blocks if it goes along the lines of the blockchain getting too large, people having to buy real hard drives, and I'm talking about miners or people who need a synchronized wallet. Obviously, the idea of the users who have their current computer wallets, synchronizing them is going to be increasingly difficult if the block size gets larger. But that, again, leads more towards paper wallets as the better solution than a computer wallet. A paper wallet can't be lost in a landfill in the same way, forgotten on an old machine, although I think we'll see less and less of that in the future. Uh, any other thoughts on the uh, transactional issues if it gets too large? Yeah, I do, actually. I think that, that one of the issues here is this directly relates to people's personal data management. There's a concept known as data proliferation, which if you just uh, use your favorite search engine, you'll see quite a lot of literature comes up there. So what the, I do think it's a real concern. I think blockchain bloat is something we should be thinking about now before it really does become an issue. Uh, because most people are lazy and they're, they're just going to adopt uh, thin wallets which then undermines the whole network because then nobody's downloading the blockchain and it loses its distributed nature. So I do think this is something we need to address. Excellent. Uh, next question. From Colorado, there's a huge turn for certain businesses moving to crypto since the banks will not accept their money. More of just a statement, but I agree with his statement, and it is a large advantage for marijuana dispensaries, both recreational, medicinal, etc., to switch to this superior form of money and a great chance to turn all of their customers on to Bitcoin as well. I think they all could benefit, uh, not just from investing, but just from the convenience of using Bitcoin and the pseudo-anonymous nature of Bitcoin when making that kind of transaction. Um, I, I, I want to say something about that. I think, you know, when I first read that story that they, they were having trouble finding um, places to deposit their cash funds, their, their cash businesses, they can't, you know, accept credit card payments. So um, I would think, you know, one-way ATMs would be great inside of a, a dispensary. They could accept Bitcoin and cash, and then the dispensary to bank themselves could deposit the cash essentially into the ATM as well and, and take Bitcoins. Um, and I'm sure they could have, you know, 
uh, there's plenty of uh, people who would love to help those kinds of businesses hedge their um, risk to the exchange rate through any number of different, you know, um, uh, trading practices that could help them do that. Or, you know, trading in crypto to crypto, you know. So it just seems like, I mean, it seems like an easy answer when, it, when the story first came out. And I think it took like two or three weeks after uh, the, the legalization went through for people to start, you know, people out there who are running those businesses to start considering Bitcoin. It just is a perfect fit. Absolutely. Let's see. More questions about uh, paper wallets. Uh, I did cover that slightly in my How to Buy Feathercoin episode, but I will cover the second half of it, how to get your money back from the paper wallet. That's still going to be an issue. Um, let's see. We've got a, a fan who listened to the uh, New York City hearings three times. Thanks for watching. Uh, let's see. Oh, why is Derek J so cute? There you go. <laughs> uh, let's see. How much, are the, how much are the 35 minutes I missed going to cost me? Well, you can always watch back the show on YouTube. It will be on later. Um, question about the penny alts. Does anyone have a, a pick or a guidance to very low-priced altcoins? No, your, it's, like playing, it's like playing the slot machines. Yeah, yeah it's, it's super risky stuff. You Talk to anyone who's mining. Um, in, I forget what kind of a, a mining pool they call it, but it's a, it's a mining pool. Um, Chris, maybe you can help me out with this, but it's a mining pool that essentially mines yeah. the what's, what's calculated to be the most profitable um, yeah. altcoin at the time. It's called multi pools. Um, yeah, the problem with those is that it encourages the kind of parasitism and um, kind of leeching effect, and it's not good for the blockchain security either because you then get peaks and troughs. We had to put in a new difficulty adjustment algorithm just in order to allow for it. So I'm not a big fan of those. I would say that I do like um, Dogecoin. Um, not not to, don't please don't buy it because I said so. But um, I like the team. I thought it was a joke at first, but then I actually got to to meet or talk to the developers through Reddit, and and I saw some of the the to and fro between our developers and theirs. And I have to say, that those guys are serious. They really are giving this a good go. So good luck to them. I wanted to add on to that about Dogecoin. Uh, Sean's outpost takes Dogecoin to feed the dogs of the homeless, um, and has had uh, some really good luck with that. The community of Dogecoin has been very very supportive. Excellent. We have a, a question about Ethereum. Isn't Ethereum a competitor to Bitcoin, and isn't it inflationary? Does anyone have an answer to that? My understanding is that it's um, it's uh, I don't think it's inflationary, but it's not. There is no cap. Uh, you know, it's a steady rate of inflation, so it's not arbitrary like we're used to experiencing. So just to just maybe this is kind of getting at the question the um, the viewer is asking. Uh, the, the reason I confront so many people who uh, decry Bitcoin's deflationary nature as like some impending tragedy, um, the reason people think that way is because that's how every other deflationary uh, currency or deflationary situation in our past has gone because of human error or human intent. Um, you know, so as soon as there's you know, uh, manipulation going on that starts a deflationary uh, downturn, it becomes a spiral because of human beings. So if you have something controlled by mathematics and transparent to everybody, you're not going to experience that same, you know, panic uh, environment because everyone can see what's going on. It would be like having a seat on the floor of Congress and in every single congressional committee hearing and everything, being able to take in all that information and have all those processes be fully transparent to you and then you can go and behave, you know, based on all, all of your analysis of those, all that intake. So uh, think of it like that. And, and if that's, um, you know, so whether an, a currency is deflationary or inflationary, as long as it's a fixed rate and fully transparent and open source code, then I don't really see a problem. Chris, Jay, anything to add? Yeah, I think that's right. I think the point of fixed issuance is that everybody knows what to expect. Um, what's bad about the current inflation in the current um, markets is that you know Ben Bernanke wakes up one day, has a bad, you know, is in a bad mood, and he just prints it and and then it just rains inflation. It, it's great for his friends in the banks, but it rains inflation on everyone else. I don't know enough about Ethereum. I still haven't seen the source code or enough about it, but I do look forward to learning more. Absolutely, my my understanding of of Ethereum is that you can put 
uh, computer code on top of Bitcoin so that you could have a social contract like a will or a trust represented in code. If the person is over 55 years of age, then pay them $500 a month from this trust. And now it's not a lawyer or a banker or an accountant making up this trust. It's a computer programmer probably selecting from a GUI that creates a, a mathematic unbreakable code that is now your will and your will is now carried out by the blockchain. So if it's anything like that, I'm really excited for it and I can't wait to see what they do next. I don't know if it's inflationary. I do think the US dollar is inflationary and it robs from people's savings. The more you save in an inflationary system, the more you lose. That's what's so great about Bitcoin being deflationary. The more you save in a deflationary system like Bitcoin, the more you win. There's only 21 million Bitcoins. It's pretty nice just to have even one of them. So, Yeah, I don't think uh, Ethereum is a competitor to Bitcoin at all. Um, if anything, it's a parallel uh, blockchain, a parallel service that you know is also, can also ride on top of Bitcoin, like you were talking about there. Um, and it, I would think of it kind of like, um, you know, let's say like, a, um, like an old Corvette, right? You still want to drive the old Corvette sometimes, but you might still want the newest model of Mercedes, whatever, right? So um, these, they all have their place, and, and without, without Bitcoin, we wouldn't have any of these other things. Bitcoin, I think, will be around a long time, uh, barring any um, internal failures. But, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think there, it might have more, uh, like, technologies like MasterCoin, Colored Coins, and... Uh, open transactions in Ethereum might have more wide use decades from now than Bitcoin will, but um, you know it'll still be there. I agree. Well, I think it's time to stop thinking of altcoins versus bitcoins. Mm -hmm. It's not a parasitic relationship; it's a symbiotic relationship. Bitcoin is the bridge by which you get your money to the altcoins. Maybe you win in the altcoins. Maybe you get killed. Maybe with Ethereum, you get a contract. Uh, there's a lot of different things that the altcoins are going to offer, and it seems like Bitcoin having its existing relationship with the legacy currency system is going to be the bridge to get there. So there's definite value on both sides, and I think most everyone is going to go up, Bitcoin and the altcoins. So we'll see what happens. But uh, Next question. Discussion about which state will regulate next is wrong. The state that doesn't regulate at all will win. That's an interesting point, Shelia. 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 Um, but um, I don't know. Um, but <laughs> it, it does. I mean, the entrepreneurs do want some kind of a regulatory framework. They're the ones that really want this because they're the ones like Charlie Shrem that are out there trading and dealing with large amounts of Bitcoin that can obviously piss the regulators off. Uh, certainly, none of us has, has ever moved a million dollars worth of Bitcoin like Mr. Shrem. So we're not in the same league, but obviously the more you move, the more you're participating in this market, the more solid footing you want underneath you. So I think it's if California lightly regulates, it's still going to be more likely to go to California rather than, say, Ohio or Idaho or somewhere that doesn't regulate at all. So, But we'll see. It's a good point. Yeah, I, I want to point um, something the viewer said in, in the statement, not really a question. You know, at the risk of feeding myself to uh, to um, the crypto anarchists, or, or Derek J in particular out there, uh, I think that the state that doesn't regulate winning w is, is, so, is 180 degrees false. You know, I see maybe some freedom-minded states like perhaps Florida or certainly New Hampshire maybe um, coming out with some just basic guidance, like basically saying Bitcoin is defined as such and we will have it fit into our existing framework as such is plenty and that might constitute quote unquote regulation and really allow the floodgates to open for businesses to start um, innovating and opening their doors uh, with Bitcoin related services. So the reason we haven't seen all these great ideas that we've read about for if you've been around for six months or more you read about things on the forums of all these great ideas that never hit the floor because entrepreneurs don't know if they are, you know, setting themselves up for being caged or, or worse. Um, they need some sort of answer out of Washington, for lack of a better term, in order to proceed. Whether that answer is, sure, everything's kosher, go ahead, or it's illegal, 
or it's kind of illegal and here's a bunch of legal jargon that you have to sift through, you know, thousands of pages of stuff. So whatever the answer is, they just need an answer and we haven't really yeah, but, had that yet. But Will, that's the whole point. They can't. The, 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 the whole world view is broken and they don't right. want to fix their world view. They just want to fix the world. And so, yeah, that's, that's defining all of these governments. Look at what they're all doing. They're prevaricating, they're procrastinating, they're putting off the inevitable. And, yeah, it's quite sad. It's quite desperate because we yeah. don't get our expectations well handled. You know, we just don't know what to expect. So you're right, yeah, whoever said that, 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 that the state that doesn't regulate will win, I, I agree with that. I mean, it is a bit like um, marijuana legalization where even just Bitcoin decriminalization where they say it's okay and you can grow it mm. and if you find it you're all right and if you use the Bitcoin or if you use the the plant that grows on the side of the road you're fine whereas marijuana legalization is a a lockstep law where it becomes more like tobacco and more like a regulated crop and I'm not sure if that's going to be good for Bitcoin but certainly the decriminalization if, if New Hampshire wanted to say Bitcoin whatever you want to do is legal here that would help them out that would cause a floodgate but well, Hawaii. What about Hawaii? It looks really nice there. <laughs> no, I, I agree with um, with you there, Chris and Thomas. You know, that's a good analogy. The the different marijuana regulations, or even any scheduled regulations for, you know, there are there are certain rules in Indiana that you know just by driving through the state you'd be violating, even if you're not even going to stay there. And maybe by creating, and you know, maybe I think you're right. Any amount of regulation isn't isn't good, but it, we might, you know, it might still allow for. Um, businesses to be able to open their doors and we can see some experiments begin maybe um, but yeah if every state has a different um, set of rules for cryptocurrencies or you know like they do for let's say you know cannabis or whatever um, then it really muddies the water and nobody knows where they can go or travel and what they can do in each place and um, it's all uh, word of mouth you know you learn by word of mouth by talking to people on the street whether or not you're, you'll be able to conduct yourself the way you're used to conducting yourself in your home area. So yeah, that is a, that's a huge problem that I see um, that could really slow things down and just frustrate people. And that might be enough to slow, uh, slow adoption or, or lower trust or you know, acceptance of this new technology. All right, our final question today. If the dollar crashed, like many believe, in 2014, would it be a run to Bitcoin or a run away from Bitcoin? Well, I'm not well, sure the dollar is going to crash, so I want to put that out there first. I but, want, uh, yeah, can I say something about that? Because I've been watching some of those videos sure. on YouTube, those dollar crash, because they come up as recommended if you're into Bitcoin, don't they? Um, yeah. You probably don't want it. Um, really, I know I, it's like this morbid entertainment that these that these people have. We've been fantasizing about apocalypse for many decades now. We were making lots of films about it in the 90s, and then we had a few more with Cloverfield in in the noughties. And I'm not so sure you really really want this. It's very hard to make money uh, in an Armageddon like that because what exactly are you planning for? The whole point of those kind of catastrophes is they're notoriously unpredictable, and so you plan for one thing, and then something else. It, it, is what gets you. So yeah, it's I, I don't think that's a desirable outcome. And um, yes, I do think that Bitcoin will go up. I don't see I don't see why it would go down in a situation like that. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. I think Bitcoin is a new safe haven for problem currencies. Uh, Argentina, Iceland, Cyprus. Yes, we uh, saw it already. Yes. yes. I mean, yeah, I can. I can... Sure. Go ahead, Thomas. Uh, if your if your country if your banks are in trouble and you have this new option of Bitcoin, even though it's a new option and it's a bit un untested, a new option is better than no option. I mean, we've all seen what can happen with runaway inflation, Weimar Germany, uh, wheelbarrows full of Deutschmarks exchanged yeah. for a loaf of bread. It, it's not unrealistic. It has happened before. I'd like to add that it's possible that the creation of Bitcoin and its promulgation has even staved off a dollar collapse uh, and provided more of a soft landing for these mm. uh, ultimately doomed currencies. We, yeah, we have been saying I always, that, that I always make that argument, Derek. Go ahead, Will. Oh, I'm sorry. I make that argument in our meetups all the time when you know we have new members come in and they are they have this very concern, you know, or or fetish, if you will, like Chris mm. was pointing out, wanting this ultimate collapse, you know, because they they're fed up with the system. I understand that. I completely sympathize with that. 
um, and, and wanting to see that happen. And I, I, I like that, Derek, you brought that up because I often say to those folks, you know, we could see a nice little soft landing or a bridge using cryptocurrency out of an old failing economy. Um, it's that would be that would be great. But as far as if there is a dollar collapse, you know, overnight or something like that, something horrific, uh, nobody's going to be worried about cryptocurrencies. They're going to be worried about food, toilet paper, and water. Yeah. So those will be the um, you know the most sought after assets out there. So um, you know. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. I, I don't have that um, preoccupation hoping to see these kinds of disasters just to see so-and-so burn at the stake or whatever, you know. It's, uh, it's not a well, good way. To... It, it's the innocent that get, that get caught up in those things. It's, it's all, it's, it'll be your granny. It'll be the, the older generations that feel alienated by things who perhaps whose object of concern wasn't ours. They didn't have time to spend on niche internet forums, okay? They, they had other mm -hmm. priorities in their life. So, yeah, this is going to have lots and lots of unintended consequences. And right now, our priority should be inspiring and educating people about Bitcoin so that they can make an informed decision. One thing that does worry me is oil dependency and also water, too, because you can only buy oil Oil with the petrodollar and that does give us cause for concern because we are mm -hmm. so very very dependent on that black stuff and um, so that that could be a, a concern for me I don't know what would happen like if you went to an OPEC nation like right now maybe you've got a, a you know tens of thousands of bitcoins I wonder what would happen if you did actually offer them okay let's have this morbid fantasy then what would happen if you went to an OPEC nation and offered them I don't know a hundred bitcoins for a barrel of oil ie orders of magnitude above the dollar value that would reveal their preference in economics that would force them to show their hand to the table and go yeah alright one barrel sure why not and then of course World War 3 would break out that wouldn't be so good I, I yeah, think I mean, after so far lot. Yeah, well, and so far it hasn't been so great with a lot of these uh, countries wanting to take uh, gold or other things for oil that, that definitely hasn't fared well for uh, those people. Um, but I, I really try to encourage people who are in that kind of fear-based mindset that, you know, we're heading towards this imminent collapse, that Bitcoin is kind of this, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, kind of like, the, you know, it's something that they can get into now uh, if they do have that concern, um, because it's a proactive solution. It, you're, when you're sitting around thinking and watching these YouTube videos all day and, you know, worrying about, oh, this collapse is coming, it's imminent, it's imminent, you know, uh, it, it, you get paralysis analysis, you can't do anything. Thing. And Bitcoin is a way to kind of end that and kind of, I think, give people hope who are in a more kind of fear-based mindset about the dollar. Absolutely. And moving on to predictions. This is the part of the show where I ask you to predict the future. It's everyone's favorite part. Are you ready? Chris J. <laughs> Not really. It's my worst. This is, this is a bit I hate. All right, we'll come back to you, but you'll be next. <laughs> Megan right. Lords. Yes. Uh, let's see. By the year 2017, Pensacola will have been taken over by Bitcoiners, and it will be renamed CryptoCola. <laughs> Derek J. I predict the IRS will continue to remain silent on the tax rules. It will later attempt to enforce on individuals. The longer they wait, the less enforceable these rules will be. Will Pangman. Uh Chris J. Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> what is this part of the show? I have no idea. <laughs> All right, this is like, the best. Just go with it. Look, Just go I, you with know, it. you know what I you know what I think. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and fudge it and hopefully whilst I'm fudging I'll come up with something. I would say it is a lot easier to predict the next ten years than the next ten days. And getting there is always the hardest part. That's why I think we enjoy doing these predictions so much. Um I think that I'm, I'm anticipating there being a lot of confusion and I'm anticipating my email inbox getting bigger and bigger and bigger with friends of mine getting in touch with me saying oh you seem to know about this Bitcoin thing can you tell me how to do X or should I buy some I'm getting more and more of those emails I expect those to go up I do not know what the cusp is going to look like I do not know w at what point we reach a tipping point quite what the impact I'm desperately desperately hoping that this is non-violent which is why I think education is probably the most important thing because what we don't want is descendancy into mob rule. Um, that's what we've, we've seen happen before when people um, try to take things into their own hands without taking personal responsibility. So that's my half-fudged answer. Will Pangman. 
Uh, I'm kind of going to fudge along, too, but I'm going to maybe pick up where Chris left off a little bit. Um, more and more people will, who you'd least suspect to be interested in something like this, are going to be interested in it, and they're going to reach out to those of you who have been, you know, so-called sharing the gospel with, with them over, you know, the last year or however long you've, you've been acquainted with this um, this uh, revolutionary technology. And I guess the prediction there would be that I, the first two topics I, I really held back a little bit on how much I think um, the, uh, the powers that shouldn't be are revealing their hand too much and exposing themselves as the authoritarian tyrants that they are to even their most content lapdogs. Um, and those dogs will start to realize that their bony ribs don't need to be so bony and that the reason they are that way is because of their, their master whose boots they've been licking all along. And <laughs> the prediction would be that, um, that uh, they're going to, more and more of them, will not only be attracted to Bitcoin, but they'll be um, disgusted or, or dissuaded from you know, their old home. Finally, I used to think that there were too many altcoins. Now I know there's not enough. 2014 will be the year of the altcoin. More than 300 will be listed on Cripsy by year's end. Hang on to your hats. We're out of time. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>